So for the past 30 years, I've led teams, departments, and businesses through record growth. I've been involved with mergers, and I've been involved with acquisitions. I've seen product introductions, product reinventions, product innovations. And I've hired and I've fired some of the best people in the world. I had a really good run. And I thought, when it was all done, I was ready to go do what a lot of people like me do. You sit on boards, you become a mentor, you invest in companies. But I'm here, somehow, at the University of Texas, and I'm teaching our students how to become empathetic, how to make mistakes, and how to lead in this new burgeoning creative economy. So the truth is, I ended up in education, but it isn't so strange that I'm here. For many, many years, I hired so many students out of college, and I watched them rise up through the ranks. And then in the last few years, what I noticed is they weren't being as successful. You see, businesses have changed. The business has changed. Product cycles today are product cyclones. The need to interact with your end user, your consumer, your employee is at rapid pace. We need to work in these multidisciplinary teams to get anything done. So the work we're doing here has two significant goals. One, it's to prepare our students beyond the 40 acres. You see, a diploma is just the price of entry. Businesses want more. And the second is to, and a little harder, is to change decades old convention in higher education learning. I'm also going to explain a little bit of how we do this, a little bit about human-centered design and design thinking because I want all of you to walk away today and think, how can I be more human-centered? So, as I said, higher education does a very good job, particularly here at the University of Texas. We do a great job educating our students, but we do it in silos. And those silos don't allow us to have cross-disciplinary work. Now, it doesn't mean that our students and our professors don't want to do that. See, the problem we have to solve is, our, is the funding problem. We're rewarded for the number of students in seats in a department. We're not rewarded for the cross-collaborative work that we do. So we have an amazing opportunity at UT to do something different. Because think of it. We have almost infinite knowledge here. We have so much research and so many smart people in this university. The cross-collaboration is, is mind-blowing. And how could we expect a recent set of graduates to go out into the world if we haven't taught them how to collaborate, how to work with others? Empathy, critical problem solving. We need to be responsible for teaching them that. Because today, we are living in a very multidisciplinary world. Our students have to learn about this. They have to learn how to live and work and perform in this world. Now, we want them to be fantastic at their craft or their discipline, whether they're business or computer science or engineering or design. But they need to be more. They need to know how to problem solve. They need to be critical thinkers. They need to understand how to work with others that are not like them. So how do we do that? So we reimagine higher education. Sounds simple, right? But we're doing it. I want to talk about, this is my favorite part of the speech, the school, the School of Design and Creative Technologies and what we're doing there. First of all, we are designing a curriculum that is responsive to the market. You see, higher education has a wonderful way of teaching a curriculum for 20 years. And in the world that we live in today, and in the discipline that we have in our school, that's very difficult to do. This curriculum embodies design thinking, entrepreneurship, and a highly collaborative work environment. And second, 
we're changing who teaches it and where we teach it. We decided that all these three, credit uh, three credits, 15 week classes, that wasn't necessarily the way that we needed to do things. And we've recognized the need for entrepreneurial skills to be taught to creative people. So this past semester, we tried something very different. 24 students were chosen out of a pool of about 100 that applied to uh, take a class that was taught by really fantastic designers up at the IBM Design Studios in North, North Austin. So each week, uh, they got on the bus and they went up to uh, IBM Studios and obviously the bus took them down too. And it was funny, as it went on in the semester, the team called it the camp bus, the design camp bus, because that's what it became. But there, they were learning problems that businesses or that particular business was dealing with. It's very much like they would teach their new employees. And it, was, it had restrictions, and they were in a corporate environment. And they were working with multidisciplinary teams of people they didn't know. But we also had mentors and, and guest speakers and lots of people to help shape this experience for them. And I have to tell you, um, it was, it was mind-bending to watch this. Think about it. Think about when you would have applied for a job if you had this type of experience or you wrote a cover letter. What would it have been like for you to talk about something like this? When we went up for the final uh, presentation after the 15 weeks, and we took a whole bunch of people up there, and I'll tell you, as I'm driving up there, I'm thinking, oh my god, I hope this worked. But we got up there, and these students were amazing. Not only was their thought process and how they solved these problems just incredible, but their presentation skills, the way they felt confident about themselves, they were transformed by this. Each and every one of them told me they wished that more of their classes were experiential, where they could learn, and they could learn with other people, because they felt like they took knowledge away from there that they could use for the rest of their life. And you know what? As educators and academics, we were transformed by this, too. And this semester, because we were so excited about it, we're doing something similar with other companies, USAA, McKinsey Design, BNSF Railroad, WP Engine. We're making sure that our students are getting real world experience in a very different setting. We've also started teaching microcredit courses. These are one credit, five week courses. Because if we want our students to understand all about the different disciplines that we're working. We want them to be able, if you're a designer, go take a computer science course. Understand how they solve problems. What's the nomenclature? If you're a computer scientist, go take an intro to design course. Understand what they're talking about. What's fabulous about these courses, and actually all of our courses, is that they're getting filled up. They're all filled up. There is a need and a desire, and there is a palpable excitement. There's like a buzz that runs around this floor that we're on. It's very exciting to watch because the students are not being taught, but they're learning. It's one thing to teach, it's another thing to learn. And they're feeling that this is something that can help them going forward. We also hired a serial entrepreneur, a woman named Jan Ryan, who happens actually to be here. And the reason we did this is we wanted to bring entrepreneurial skills right to our creative team. You know, what I've noticed in my career is nobody ever, ever wanted to talk to creative people about business or entrepreneurial skills. That was actually for somebody else. That didn't make sense to me. You know, it's another piece of the problem. It's a puzzle for them to solve. And our students have really embraced uh, Jan is inundated with them, has really, have really embraced the concept and what to do with it. So you're wondering probably, who's teaching all those courses? You got a hint here. A lot of them are professionals. There are people that are, are in the industry that are doing the work, that are staying on the cutting edge, 
that know where the trends are going. This is what's going to keep our students competitive in the marketplace. This is what's going to help them get out there and get jobs and be recognized. So that's the how. Let me talk to you a little bit about the what. What are we teaching here? Well, and how are we going to make this stick? So really, we're teaching empathy. How many of you know what design thinking is or human-centered design? Guys, anybody take a course here? OK, good. We got, we got a few. So design thinking or human-centered design is often confused with the visual aspect of design. It's the tangibility of it. But really, what it is, it's a methodology that designers have actually used since the 1960s. And what they do with this methodology is they're trying to solve a, a couple of, or answer a couple of questions. What is the actual problem we're trying to solve? And who are we trying to solve that problem for? And with this methodology, you will go through a discovery phase, and in insights, ideation, experimentation, testing, failure, come back to ideation, testing, failure, and you do kind of a rinse and repeat until you come up with a solution that's human-centered, that people will use, that's made for someone. It uses often interdisciplinary team because what you want to do is get different people's ideas of how to solve this. You know, People coming at it from a software perspective and people coming at it from a design perspective and people coming at it from an engineering perspective will have different ways of looking at a problem. And we want to make sure that you bring in all those ways. Because if I've learned anything, there's never one way to solve a problem. And empathy is a huge part of what we teach. Now, empathy is not sympathy. It's not feeling sorry for people. In fact, it's understanding people at a deep personal level. And why is that important? Well, if you're going to create something for humans, you might as well understand them. Otherwise, we can create it for the monkey. So we want to understand people. Now, this is a soft skill. This is a skill that hasn't been valued, so to speak. But you know, before I took this position at the University of Texas, I did my design research. I did my human-centered design, and I talked to businesses, and I talked to professors, and I talked to students, and I talked to parents. What was very interesting about this is businesses told me, almost hands down, when they told me the type of student, they just expected the students coming out of the University of Texas to have fantastic craft. They were going to be great engineers or whatever, but they wanted them to have these other skills, and one of those skills was empathy. Because they understand today you have to work in a team dynamic, and they have to be able to work with people. And they have to solve problems quickly. Businesses also understand today you cannot run a business from the bottom of a spreadsheet anymore. It's about the humans that surround you and the humans you serve. And we're seeing more and more businesses today using this type of thinking. Businesses, nonprofits, governments, it's all over. So, how many of you remember Blockbuster here? I loved Blockbuster. Okay, so Friday, right? Friday would come, and that was like the release day. And you'd have to run to Blockbuster, and you'd get the new release, and you'd run home, and I know like everybody would want to watch it. You had 24 hours to watch it, the new release. Now, you could keep the new release longer, but the late fees were quite hefty, so you returned it. And this is just the way we did things, right? We accepted it. That was the norm. So a gentleman named Reed Hastings was doing the same thing. He was going to Blockbuster, only he kept his DVD a little bit too long. And when he went to return it, the late fees exceeded the cost of a new DVD. And he said, hmm, there's got to be a better way. And what was that better way? Netflix. So he. And what Netflix initially did was they just had a DVD mail-in service. You bought a subscription. And what you did was you, you, know, you sent it along. And um, you could watch it whenever you wanted. And it changed the viewing habits of everybody. You, the human, oh, 
Us, we were in control. We could do what we want. We didn't have to worry about whether we were going to have a late fee or not. We just wouldn't get the video you know, until we sent it back. So, so Netflix, as you know, became so popular that they were trying to get more content from studios. But studios didn't want to give them the content, interestingly enough. So they decided they were going to make their own content, which everybody laughed at. But they also had something. They were watching how humans viewed. And what they knew is that humans viewed things all at once because people don't have time. Hence, not only did they develop new content, but they released it all at once. And we now have the new phenomenon of binge watching. I am a binge watcher. I don't know about all of you, but I am a binge watcher. And so what they did was they really looked at human behavior and how to make that successful. Last year, I met a fabulous designer. I interviewed her for my column, uh, a woman named Ariel Keenan. She works for the city of New York um, in the innovation group. And she was tasked with figuring out how to help the homeless population in New York during dangerous and inclement weather. Now, New York City is huge. So many agencies. And she used design thinking with all these agencies to map the journey of a homeless person. And all of these agencies began to co-create with her in a group how you would change the system. And that went from data to communications to infrastructure. And they changed it. And she was so moved by that that she created tools for all these agencies so they can go out and do this themselves. This stuff works. Now, we can't talk about the relevance of design and design thinking. We're talking, getting back to how we teach our students about mistakes and failure. You see, I hate the F word. I think it's misused because we spend our lives telling our students and telling ourselves not to fail. How many of you, when you came home with a failing grade, your parents jumped up and down and said, fail fast? I don't think that happened. Or in a business situation where you make a mistake and somebody will usually say to you, well, whose head's going to roll? We are actually talking about learning. And what we need to do is make sure our students understand that making mistakes is part of continuous learning. We need to be learning in a continuous fashion. It's not about failure. It's about learning. So I just want to say this. I think the road from childhood to adulthood is filled with wonderment, with learning, with wanting to seek out information. And we have a job to do, which is to make sure that we're creating the right environment and we're giving our students the right information to go forward and be successful, not just in their work career, but in their life. You know, the speed and pace isn't gonna slow down. But we need to teach them ways to cope and deal with it so we can relieve the stress. We need to teach them how to work in the world that we're living in today. And what's great is that it is happening here at the University of Texas. Because you know, what we say is what happens here changes the world and it's happening. So thank you very much and hook them horns.